Good evening, everyone. I'm sorry about a little bit of our delays. Um, it's great to be with you for a bit this evening. As I shared at our April meeting, I would be back with you, um, and I'm glad to be here with you this evening. Um, I also want to share that I'm so thrilled tonight that we have the ability to live stream this in multiple languages live um, to families across St. Paul as well. So I'm, I'm very appreciative of uh, the interpreter services that we're using tonight to help us. Thank you to our offices of engagement who reached out to our families, and I'm, I'm very glad that uh, you're all able to join us tonight. I'd also like to acknowledge Teacher Appreciation Week. To our teachers in SPPS and teachers around the world, thank you. I'd like to introduce you to one of my former teachers, Mrs. Bell. She's not here with me. But I would like to share that back in 1982 in Madison, Wisconsin, Mrs. Bell became my middle school teacher and my first and only black teacher. She might be upset that I may not recall specific math strategies she used to keep me going, but I can tell you more importantly what she did for my life. She recognized my race. Having a black father and white mother was very difficult for me. I didn't know where to fit in, and at times I questioned myself. Mrs. Bell acknowledged me, taught me how to love myself, and she believed in me. She could have let me get away with not doing my work, misbehaving, or treating other people poorly. Mrs. Bell held me to the highest standards possible. When I did make mistakes, and they were often, she supported me to name the mistake, to learn from it, and to help me grow from what I learned. Many were not able to recognize the lack of confidence or belief in myself that I had when I was younger. Mrs. Bell helped me overcome the feeling of being less than. She built a safe community for all of her students and made sure each of us were equal owners and that we work together as a community. Thank you, Mrs. Bell, and thank you to teachers all across SPPS and across our world. Students out there listening tonight, this has been hard for your parents and caretakers, but I also know this has been hard for you. I want you to know that I think about you, and when I'm making decisions, I care deeply about you, and I believe in you. Having Mrs. Bell as a teacher changed my life, and I know that she would demand that I work as hard as I can for you. It is also National Nurses Week, and to the many licensed school nurses, health assistants, and nurses all over the world, thank you. This global crisis has only shined the light brighter on the incredible importance of responsive, equitable and adequate healthcare providers in our community. Thank you to our school nurses and nurses everywhere. We're also a week removed from school principal appreciation week. Well, walking the halls these days has changed immensely. I'm so appreciative of the level of skill our principals possess, their engagement and collaboration as a team, and the endless conviction they have for leading their school communities. Especially in these uncertain days, leadership matters. Thank you to all of our principals. Today, I'll be sharing general updates with you. The first is information that we've collected from social media. I've asked my colleague, Dr. Akia, excuse me, Dr. Achea, Executive Director of Research Evaluation and Assessment, to present these data to me in a top 10 list. Here are some of the findings. Number one, distance learning is not going well or is worse than face-to-face -face school. I absolutely agree with many of the people who share that in so many different ways. But one way that we're looking to combat that is our cultural specialists and our Office of Family Engagement and Community Partnerships are reaching out to families and trying to break down some of the barriers that language can, can cause when we're making a change of this magnitude, making sure that our families are connected, able to access and engage and be supported in the learning that is being provided for students. The second one is teachers are doing a great job of na navigating distance learning. Well, I can tell you that uh, with a directive on March 15th that your classroom is now um, in your household and that everything that you did at your school is now being done in a remote way uh, is as drastic a decision that I had to share uh, ever in my career. Um, it's a big change. And I've appreciated in the seven weeks now that we've been working towards this, uh, how much our teachers have embraced, um, in some cases, this level of discomfort. Uh, they've reached out to families and to students. They've worked together as colleagues across the city. Uh, we see examples of lessons and videos and things of that nature that are being shared throughout St. Paul Public Schools. And it, it's brought us closer together in terms of how can we do this the best way possible in a consistent way. The third is distance learning presents an overwhelming amount of work for both students and families to navigate. Um, I agree, and um, in my mind, one thing I want you to know for me, families, is I do not for a minute think that I understand and know every individual family need uh, or challenge that this presents to them. 
every one of our households is special and unique. And I can't for a minute expect for the decisions I make and the support I give to be right or perfect for that matter for everyone. We need to continue to work together uh, we need to understand what the expectations are, and I have implored our staff to find and, and define as much flexibility as possible, making sure that we're not overwhelming anyone uh, in our stakeholder community, and that's for our families, our students, and all of our staff. Uh, so we need to work together in that way, and um, it would be very much a goal of mine to uh, minimize the level of families being overwhelmed and students being overwhelmed during distance learning. Number four, distance learning is a mixed bag of both good and bad experiences. I will kind of leave that one at that. I would agree, um, you know, as a parent myself and trying to lead uh, this work in our district, uh, definitely have experienced both ends of it. Number five, distance learning is going well, well as or better than traditional school. This one has me curious and I've heard anecdotes about um, people exclaiming this, whether it's students or families or some of the staff and observing uh, some of the behaviors of their students and um, I don't think this says to me that this is the way we should do school forever. Don't get me wrong. But I do think there are some really good things that we can learn about this time and how we might use some of these techniques or strategies or ways of connecting uh, in a more regular way for whatever the next iteration of schooling is as we go through the summer and into the fall. Number six, distance learning presents particular challenges for students with special needs. Um, it absolutely does. And, and we know that in our Office of Specialized Services, uh, working in a mainstreamed way wherever possible as defined by student IEPs, individual education plans, we very much want to look to modify and adapt and find ways to accommodate for the unique special uh, needs of our students and making sure that all feel extremely welcome and supported and part of their school community. That's brought some challenges now that we um, have a lot of our assistive technology and a lot of those uh, techniques and and strategies that we use are very much a face-to-face, -face, um, in some cases, a physical way of working with, with students. So we've had to truly define different ways to support students with special needs. It's far from perfect, but please know that the staff in SPPS are really dedicated to this. Um, it's something that we talk about often every day in terms of what are new challenges that are presented, uh, what are new supports that we've learned that we can share. And we very much want distance learning to be uh, for our entire community, for all of our students, and uh, involve all of our staff. Distance learning embeds engaging activities and learning platforms. I think in some cases it absolutely does. Uh, navigating some of those systems, uh, again, can be challenging, but uh, we are learning all the time and engaging with our uh, vendors and other service providers, ways to optimize based on what we're hearing from you, based on what we're hearing from our staff, and having the ability to make changes where we can. I'm also looking for new uh, and exciting ways that we can add um, uh, platforms to our uh, to how we support our students and support distance learning. Number eight, families desire the structure the face-to-face -face school provides. Absolutely, I think uh, the structural frame of, of this work is by far the, the, the biggest change. Um, you can't uh, close the doors to the school and say, we're going to do this in this new way, in a remote way. Um, so uh, I think all of us are mourning different aspects of the face-to-face -face experience, and, and that's something I can't for a minute uh, try to make up for, only to say that I acknowledge it, and as we think about our future, uh, we will definitely uh, look for ways to take what's best of our face-to-face -face opportunities and make sure that we're finding a way uh, to still continue to provide those supports. Number nine, <clears throat> there are challenges in using Schoology and other applications. Um, these are highly technical apps and um, have many different features that are used by some, but not all. Um, again, we are attempting to provide general guidance and general support. Uh, know that we have staff that are at all different uh, levels of uh, ability and comfort with Schoology and some of the other applications. So you, you may definitely experience, even in your own household, a different level of how those uh, learning platforms, learning management systems are used. Ten, and I think this one speaks to me the most, Kids miss school and the social emotional aspects of face to face of the face to face experience, um, without a doubt. Um, I cannot replicate that on a computer screen. Um, you know, I myself working with the several teams and, and even you tonight. Uh, this is not my favorite way to engage, uh, and, and not many that I've met. 
Uh, this is the way we're going to do it. Uh, this is the way that we'll look to enhance and embrace the opportunities that we have to make them the best that they can. But I too miss our kids, our staff, um, our community coming together uh, and sharing space together. So Sunday morning, this past Sunday, after a beautiful Saturday, if you remember, um, I woke up with a lot on my mind and um, I did something that I don't recommend, but uh, for me, it really helped. I, I went to Twitter and I unleashed a series of 40 tweets and it started just from a list that I've been compiling in my head of uh, some things that I wanted to share with the, the, commun the community, you know, those who are on Twitter. Let me just highlight some of the things that I shared before I get into some of our questions for tonight. Um, I continue to talk about attendance uh, being far more than a, uh, a checked box for me. Attendance is truly connection. It's accessing, it's engaging, and it's supporting. Um, attendance for us, again, if you remember, is the stay-at-home order. We know where students are supposed to be. Um, my job is to look for how are we connecting? How are we ensuring that there's support? How are we engaging? And how can we measure that? How can we ensure that this is happening um, right now and into the future? Uh, we continue to work on our budget. Uh, school budgets in the state of Minnesota have to be balanced and they have to be approved by local boards of education by June 30th, the end of June. As it stands, our board meeting in June is June 23rd. Uh, so that would be when I bring a, an adopted budget for approval uh, to our board of education. And again, uh, that budget will be balanced, meaning that the money that we're going to spend next year is also has the um, amount of revenue coming in. So we plan for that budget to be balanced. So we're going through the process now of how can we make sure that those two things align? And you're right if you're thinking this, well, how do you know with the level of uncertainty in the future? And it's hard, it's challenging. Uh, so we have to think broadly. Um, the way that I have to think about this is I have to think about opening a school district next year in September, uh, really July 1st for our fiscal year, uh, that looks a lot like it did this past year. I have to be ready to be able to staff our buildings to support your students the way uh, that you remembered it prior to March 10th. Um, so that's the way that we're moving forward right now with the direction that we've received thus far. Uh, talked about connection enrollment. Uh, so you know, we do continue to enroll students, kindergarten, uh, pre-K all the way up. Um, and you can find enrollment information on our website. There's both a phone number and an online portal uh, for families, new families or continuing families to engage if they need assistance with placement. Um, essential kid care, we continue to offer essential kid care. The essential kid care is, is child care that the district is um, putting on to St. Paul's essential workers. And uh, essential workers have been defined through this whole process and it's a pretty long list right now, but we have consistently had 125 students uh, taking part in that. The executive order governing essential kid care ends at the end of the school year. Um, so we don't yet know what the summer will bring. St. Paul Public Schools has a, a child care program in the summer that um, takes care of roughly 1,600 young people, uh, children. So we need to look for a way of, are we going to be given permission to continue our child care? Is essential kid care going to be extended? Is there going to be some combination? Uh, one thing I want you to know is that we want to be here uh, for the children of St. Paul and to support our family. So we will work with the guidance that we're given and we'll be sure to communicate with all of you. Graduation, I'll address in a few of the questions that come up later uh, in the segment. Just know that this, uh, again, has been a really painstaking uh, decision for us. Um, and I don't want you to think for a minute, I know how it feels to be a senior if you're out there um, or the parent or family member of a senior, I don't. Um, I've, I've seen how this has been impacting people around the country, whether it be college or, or high school, and uh, my heart goes out to you. We want to make it as meaningful as, as possible, um, and we're working really hard to do that as an entire city, as a St. Paul Public Schools. Just a few more here. iPads, again, will be, uh, students will keep them all summer, uh, all summer long, students that remain in SPPS. Materials collection, uh, many of you know, because we've been around our schools, that this time of year and a little bit later, it's amazing how many materials amass in, in our schools, uh, lost and found tables and things like that. So we've got to make sure uh, that we provide a safe and orderly and structured way for students and staff to return in a, um, in a manner that's, that's going to be safe so that they can retrieve those items. Uh, so we'll be getting information out 
uh, to families to share with them, to share with all of you how we're going to go about doing that. Uh, meals, as you know, last Friday was Lunch Hero Day. Um, over a million meals, almost 1.6 million, million meals uh, served by St. Paul Public Schools. Um, just incredibly um, impressive that we continue to do that. SPPS has always had a summer meals program. Uh, we're not only looking to continue that, we're looking to expand that. Uh, we are working hard with the federal government and our lobbyists to, um, um, to assure that there's going to be funding there in order to do that. We believe it's very important for us to continue that and I'm um, really proud of our nutrition services staff for that. Uh, just a couple of more. Uh, next year, I'll get into as well in a, in a bit with some of the questions. Um, summer school is coming up and yes, there will be some online um, options that we are looking to uh, create right now uh, in terms of credit recovery and in terms of some of the high school English language developmental uh, courses that we can offer. Uh, but beyond that, our K-8 program that's always very popular as well, some of our enrichment and uh, courses for intervention, we're not going to be able to order um, offer in the manner that we have previously. Uh, we're still looking to uh, receive guidance both from the state, uh, but I'm committed to making sure that we look for ways to connect with our SPPS students and families throughout the summer. Um, a program you might hear about called SPPS Summer Connect. Uh, it's, it's my vision. <laughs> it it uh, doesn't have great details right now, but my staff have been thinking a great deal about what are the ways that we can stay connected with our students, with our families. Uh, I want you to know that, um, that we're here for you, uh, that we are establishing some consistency in these uncertain times and anything that we can do to help all of our families, all of our students through the summer months leading up into the next school year, I think is a good thing and something I want to commit to. So with that, I'm going to turn over to some of the questions that I received and I want to thank uh, those of you for submitting them. And I'll go until about 7.03 tonight. We're a little bit late. So um, let me just share with you right now that we will go over time a little bit. Hopefully that's okay with the studio back at our district office. But is there any realistic chance that students can return to school buildings in the fall? If all instruction remains online, what changes will there be from the way online instruction was done this spring? Uh, those are great questions. And the way that I've worked with our teams is in three phases. Um, and these aren't phases that were given to me. This is so I can help organize our way of thinking in St. Paul Public Schools around the tasks that we um, have upon us right now. The first is phase one, and we're in phase one. Phase one was from March 15th when we received Executive Order 2002 up until the end of the school year, which you know Governor Walz extended the school closure a couple of few weeks ago. Um, so that uh, to me put the bookends on phase one of remote learning, distance learning. Phase two is the summer months. And I shared with you a little bit about what our plans are and how they continue to be defined. Uh, we are awaiting guidance from the Minnesota Department of Education, MDEU here may refer to them as, and we will be getting information out about that in addition to SPPS Summer Connect. Um, and, and throw into that also our child care program or essential kid care, that, that combination of things. And then the really big question is fall. What is September going to look like? And I really don't have the answer to that right now. Um, I have followed my colleagues and uh, large cities and leaders across the country, um, organizations that, that, that support education around the country. And uh, so I've been engaged in a lot of discussions, but none of us have the guidance for what school is going to look like in September. What I can share with you is, um, would I recommend starting the school year exactly how we are right now? Um, no, and I think I would call phase one um, distance learning 1.0, you know, kind of our first iteration of it. Uh, by the time fall comes, if we are still in a distance learning environment solely, uh, it'll have to be a new version of that. We're going to have to learn from what we accomplished and uh, what our shortcomings were uh, during this period of time to make those enhancements and improvement. Um, and then we have to look at um, what, if we're not going to be fully uh, distance learning, are we going to be fully back in schools? And what would those situations be? How would we be able to safely open our schools? What are the physical changes we have to make to our buildings? What is the education around social distancing and the health guidelines that we would have to put in place? Where would that training take place? You can imagine the level and layers of different training, communication, information that would have to take place. My best guess is that it will be somewhere in between, as you can probably imagine. Um, and, and I don't exactly know what that means. 
um, it makes it very difficult uh, for our, our families and our staff if we are going to think about a hybrid where we're going to mix schedules throughout the week. Um, yeah, I have a daughter who's a student at the U of M and her schedule, her, if I had to be responsible as a parent for her, um, you know, it would be impossible to do and work full time. Um, it really would. So in knowing that, um, we have to think very carefully about great decisions we make around a hybrid type system. Um, so those are kind of the three different uh, posts of, of what I think about school uh, next year as we start. And we're just going to have to continue to work together, communicate with each other, and first and foremost, make sure that we're safe and that we can provide a, an excellent and consistent educational experience for, for all of our students. What happens to students who don't do their homework during distance learning? Again, we're focusing so much on can we connect with our students and can we help them uh, get work accomplished? Um, I don't want to claim for a minute uh, that I know that uh, work being done at home is going to be uh, done at the same level or have the same level of support in every one of our households. So I think our staff have, have worked to be incredibly flexible, supportive, and if there are any concerns over um, work not being done, um, either there's not enough being done or it's too hard to get done, please reach out to your school teacher or your principal. My child, a ninth grader who normally excels in school, is now failing most classes. How will we move forward with children who are struggling with distance learning? Will there be virtual summer school, repeating classes in the fall? You know, this is an area that has uh, received a lot of attention in terms of what has happened during this period of time in terms of the level of learning. And it's, of course, going to be different from uh, young person to young person in terms of their course loads and, and how those courses have been able to um, take place in a distance learning environment. So we're going to look at every option possible to do a few things. One, is there a way that we can extend school day in the future uh, to provide students some of the missed opportunities um, that perhaps this caused for them? Is there a way to add additional support? Um, is there also a way for us to offer some of the developmental education courses for students who missed uh, some of their services, uh, English language services, special education services? So those are things that we'll have to look at in terms of recouping some of this time if it was not um, met at the same standard um, that we'll have to look into. Uh, beyond that, we're going to have to think very carefully about, and, and this is where, you know, one of the comments that I'll make is that um, you know, we've talked about education without walls for a number of years, meaning that our society is built on five days a week, eight hours a day, um, periods, um, seating charts in classrooms, number of minutes students are in each class, uh, grade levels. I mean, you think about all those things that have truly bound our, our system and that we um, uh, sometimes call a constraint to, to what we do. Well, now that's gone. Education without walls is, is our new reality. However, all of us could argue that this isn't the best way to do it how we are now, but I do think that we're going to have to look at some of what has worked really well during this time and find ways to bring that into how we do school if we are back into our physical environments in the same way. Um, so there's a, there's a lot that is going on, in, uh, going on in our minds just in terms of what are we learning uh, from this standpoint and talking with my colleagues around the Metro, these are very common conversations they are having as well. Uh, let's see, moving on a little bit. Due to the teacher strike and COVID-19 closures, students had almost four weeks without instruction. Um, it's different than Minnesota school districts. Um, you know, there were you know, spring breaks happened in here in Minneapolis, in St. Paul, Minneapolis, and West St. Paul. We all had the same spring break. So we didn't get a chance to get distance learning up and running, and we were right away on spring break. Um, that was a, you know, that was our calendar that was approved by the Board of Education. Um, I did not think at that time uh, that it was within our favor to have school over spring break for a variety of reasons, uh, but that is our schedule. Uh, we're back into things now. Uh, we have looked to make accommodations for the grading transition from quarter three to quarter four. It might not be ideal or it might not be perfect, but we feel it's the best way to honor our students and to hold them harmless for uh, decisions that weren't their own in a pandemic that is they're not the cause of. Uh, so we're trying to do this in the most respectful way possible and also provide you um, information in a, in a timely way. I will say that a lot of the information is coming fast and furious, not quite as fast as it was a few weeks ago when I was on with you, but we continue to seek and, and need some guidance, um, both from the state and even internally as we're working with different stakeholder groups about decisions impacting students. iPads, I said, would stay with students over the summer. 
summer school we talked about. It seems like many summer plans, camps, and summer jobs for kids have changed because of virus restrictions. So it'd be nice to have some more learning opportunities. I agree. We'll look to uh, to do this as much as possible. I, I am on a few of our nonprofit boards in the community, and a lot of their work is in the summer and internships and things of that nature. Um, those leaders are working very hard to find out where, if possible, those opportunities can continue. I mean, in some cases, it works beautifully, and in others, it just isn't going to be possible, at least right now. So I don't want to give up um, hope altogether. Just know that we're working as hard as we can with all of our partners and internally as well to provide those opportunities. Decision about Discovery Club Summer, I talked about a little bit. Again, this will be a combination of um, information we get about essential kid care, child care, and some of the other programs. Um, our Director of Community Education, Tony Walker, has put May 18th out as a day that he hopes uh, we can communicate um, uh, following uh, information that we received to you about the summer program, including Discovery Club. When will early childhood screening be available again? Uh, the Department of Health and Department of Education have yet to offer those guidelines um, for early childhood screenings. And once they're released, we'll resume the screening. If parents of early learners are concerned about their child's development, they can refer their child to Help Me Grow and our SPPS team will contact families to discuss their concerns. Evaluations for special education are being conducted by video conferencing and parent interviews to the extent possible. And again, you can go to this website, helpmegrowmn.org, helpmegrowmn.org backslash. Was an August graduation ceremony considered? If so, why was it turned down? If not, can it be considered? Um, a number of our venues, again, we have about 12 different ceremonies throughout the city in you know, beautiful spaces, uh, working with uh, most, mostly our, our post-secondary education partners. And um, uh, they canceled a lot of those, um, th those venues, uh, even through August. Uh, so those spaces aren't available. And right now that's the guidance that we have from them. So the, with the level of unpredictability, what I wanted to opt for is making sure that I could provide the container for our schools to hold their graduation ceremonies in, um, making sure that they were consistent throughout the district, making sure we understood what we could support. And when considering our options, we also believe a June timeline was better as many of our seniors would have moved on to their post-secondary options and, and being more difficult uh, to track them down and to engage them with plans later in the summer. Um, I'd also like to hear about the virtual graduation and um, is the district giving them access to their cap and gowns for graduation, how will that work? Uh, let me share with you and a lot more will be coming out both from your sites because even though I wanna have some consistency in the district, I also wanna honor the traditions uh, that make each of the schools and programs unique. Um, I've been at every one of the graduations and, and each of them has their, um, has their traditions that are really important to uh, students, families, and, and the staff. Uh, we're doing home deliveries of caps and gowns beginning next week, including honors cords and tassels. We are also sending your senior a sign to display in your yard or window to celebrate their accomplishment. The reason we're arranging for these deliveries next week is so that you can take those pictures and so our seniors will be able to submit a photo in their cap and gown for the virtual ceremony. The virtual ceremonies will take place on the same day and time that's posted. Uh, we will be able to ho host those on our website streaming such as it is right now and also um, on the web for people around the world to watch um, as well. With the March transition to distance learning, the district made a decision to give all students passing grades for their work in third quarter. Um, again, this flexibility has gone back and forth a lot. Uh, the Department of Education did provide guidance uh, late last week. Uh, so we are communicating that next week. Uh, but again, looking for as much flexibility, holding our students harmless and making sure that anything doesn't negatively impact them in the future that is far out of their control. So we'll be getting more uh, clarity on that as, as we move forward. Kind of back to graduation, I got a little bit ahead of myself. We also are offering signs for our fifth and eighth graders. Um, schools have put in orders for those signs as well. I saw a mock-up of one of those today and, and they're pretty cool. Uh, I was really happy that our print shop, our own St. Paul Public Schools print shop, is going to be taking care of all of the signs that are uh, printed and distributed to our students and, and to our community. So I can't wait to see them um, throughout the community. A few more questions here before I cut away for the evening. 
It's curious if Crossroads will be put on a regular schedule like all the other schools uh, since we will be online learning. At this point, it's really hard to make that decision midstream. Uh, we are following the current schedule. We have not had any discussions or made any decisions about changing that schedule. How and when we'll be able to turn books to school. As I said, we'll be setting up schedules and times and information about that. And then lastly, a question about physical education. At some middle schools, there's no physical education option for some students. Some children won't have physical education for two years in a row. Why can't all middle schoolers take physical education? It should be first come first, shouldn't be first come first serve. Um, our students should be receiving at least one quarter of FIAD every year in all grades. And if they're not, I'd like you to encourage you to reach out to your, your child's principal. In some cases, just from my past, it could be a schedule conflict where too many electives want to be taken in the same year and it doesn't work with the schedule. But we want to provide a well-rounded education for our students and we have spent the last two years analyzing how we can do this more consistently throughout St. Paul Public Schools. So that is a, uh, a lot of information in a half hour that I threw your way. I can't tell you enough um, how much I appreciate your incredible patience, your support of our schools and your teachers, our school communities, uh, what we're trying to accomplish as a school district. I remain incredibly proud of St. Paul Public Schools. I've said this to many, I don't think there's a district uh, that is that is operating um, distance learning in the manner that we are and there's a lot to work on and there's a lot that might not be going well but there's a lot to be proud of too um, please know that as we move to the future um, students i told you earlier um, i'm thinking about you constantly and the question about how will students react or what will the students think is one that i often think of as we think about designing a new school um, so i do know that uh, our research evaluation and assessment uh, department has also begun to put out surveys uh, to our staff and to students so we want to gather as much information as we can at this time that will help us make those decisions in the future so until next time i want to thank you again for for joining me tonight uh, thank you for all that you do and please reach out to me if i can be of any support or assistance to you thanks a lot spps and i'm really proud of all of your efforts thank you <laughs>